Heavenly Father, as we open up your words, I pray again that you would open up hearts. Heavenly Father, the message that you give to the churches in Revelation is vitally important. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will create receptive hearts and minds to what you have to say to us through this message. Heavenly Father, guide us and lead us into the people you would have us be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. We are going to be starting in verse 18. We are continuing our series that we began uh, last month on the seven churches in the book of Revelation. These are the first few chapters, and we're looking at what the Apostle John wrote under the divine inspiration of Revelation by Christ and Christ's message to the church, as well as as, as the story continues and the chapter continues, the book continues to uh, other parts of future things. What we have been doing as a church is we've been looking at these seven churches is as to say that Oakdale could be a member of one of these churches. Each one of us could be a member of one of these churches by what it is described as and what is taking place in this church. Before we dive into this, this particular verse, though, I want to explain some things about the city of Thyatira. It's important to understand what was going on in these cities culturally because it reveals to us something that was happening within the scripture. One thing that was well noted in Thyatira is that it was a city controlled by guilds. Guilds were very important. Now, for some of us, the most we know about guilds is a lollipop guild from The Wizard of Oz. Um, great catchy song. But a guild is a collection of workers. They serve, they serve sort of like a, a union or a way of organizing the membership. But basically what it meant was that if you were not a part of the guild, for your respective craft, be it woodworking or ironwork or, or cloth making, ink dyeing, whatever your craft was, you had to belong to a guild or else you weren't allowed to work in the city. If you tried to, you could be fined, you could be, you could be just bullied out of town, or you would be uh, said to be a great disrespect or your work was shoddy because you didn't belong to the guild. It was a way of both protecting the workers as well as um, continuing to perpetuate their trade. Now, the thing about a guild in this city was that a lot of times a guild had a deity, which means that part of being a member of the guild oftentimes meant you had to go and practice the offerings or the, the uh, feasts or the sensuality or the sexuality of the practices that went along with the adoration and worship of this deity. So Christianity comes into the city and Christians turn their lives over to Jesus Christ and say only he will we worship, but I'm also a craftsman. So what do I do now that I, I want to continue? This is what I know, this is my trade, but I'm a believer in Jesus Christ now. What do I do when I go at, to this next meeting? They say, okay, it's time for you to offer your food up, to sacrifice it to our deity, and then to engage with uh, the, all the evil practices that we normally do in worshiping our God, or their, their deity. And the Christian said, what are we to do? If I don't do this, I'm going to be run out of town, I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to lose my livelihood, but I also want to be faithful to the God that I serve, to Jesus Christ. What should I do? So that was, that's sort of the, the context that this issue with the church in Thyatira is set. Read with me now and we'll explore more what the issue was. And before I begin, I want to say this is one of the longer letters and it's also one of the scariest, really. Um, because we see Jesus in a mode here that we don't often think of him as. But it's one that we need to take seriously. Let's read his description. Again, each time the church was written to, Christ identified himself in a different fashion. They all refer back to chapter 1. But let's look at how he introduces himself to the church in Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. 
if you remember back to uh, the first time we looked at this, these are words of purification. These eyes that look like flames of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Whenever a metal was to be purified, it would be sent through the fire so that the fire could burn up all the impurities. And here we see in these two contexts, Christ saying that, that, that I am the Son of God, a God who wants to bring about purification. And if you are in a state of evil, if your life is filled with impurities, this can be a, a, a scary thought. It doesn't have to be because we know that Christ paid the penalty for those sins. So honestly, what we can do if our life is full of impurities, what we ought to do is go to Christ, confess those sins, accept the forgiveness that comes because of his death on the cross, and live for him. I got to the gospel early this Sunday, y'all. Isn't that good? Got right there to it. But for some, well, let's just read about it. Verse 19. Christ says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed your first. Starting out good, so far so good. Jesus says, I know your works, I know your love, I know your faith. I know that the work you're doing now is better than the work that was, you had when you first started. This is a church that had great love for one another. This is a church that had great acts of, of, of service. This is a church that was filled with faith in Jesus Christ. They were improving in the things that they did. But, verse 20, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Let's pause there. If you study the New Testament, you'll often come across this issue of food offered to idols. We have our current modern day issues. We have issues surrounding what the Bible says about abortion, what the Bible says about homosexuality. Here in, our, here in the election season, all different things are being questioned on what God's word says. And each sort of generation has its questions about what does the Bible say about this. That early first generation church, a big issue for them was, do I eat food sacrificed to idols? Oftentimes, as Christians were continuing to live their lives in this, this early, this first century, they may go to a friend's house who was not yet a believer. And the believer would bring them out a nice uh, piece of meat, and they would begin eating it. And the person would say, oh, yeah, I offered this up to, uh, you know, Dionysus earlier today. I hope you enjoy it. Well, the Christian then was met with a problem. Well, do I keep eating this? Did I know that this was offered up to this goddess? Or do I reject it because my Savior is Jesus Christ? And it became a big issue um, in the first century church. What the Jewish council advised the Christians to do was to abstain from eating meat offered to idols, not because they believed that there was anything inherently now evil about the meat, but it was so that unity could be maintained. It was a sense of, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to try to put this person to shame. I'm not going to try to, to cause a rift. We'll be able to fellowship so that they, they lay down the benefit of being able to eat the meat so that unity among believers could be preserved. Because some believers said, hey, there's nothing wrong with eating this meat. I serve Jesus Christ. There's nothing, you know, about this. So they, it was an effort to preserve peace. We see something different happening here inside Tyra. These Christians, it wasn't just that they were questioning, should I eat meat that someone else offered to idols? This prophetess, this Jezebel, was saying, it's okay. And here's the issue. She was saying, you belong to a guild. Your guild offers up meat to this deity, Christian. It's okay. Go ahead. Offer up your praise to that other deity. If it includes sexuality, go ahead and do that. You're a Christian now. That's free for you to do. you got to keep your job. you got to provide for your family. Go ahead. It's okay. And encourage them 
to do that. And the thing is, we see uh, something interesting happen in these churches. In just a little bit, we're going to hear the phrase that this was known as the deep things of Satan. You had this woman who was calling herself a prophetess, Jesus referring to her as Jezebel. We don't know that Jezebel was her name. Uh, we, we think this is more symbolism of Jezebel in the Old Testament who brought paganism, who brought, who brought idol worship into the Israelites' uh, life. But she's saying it's okay, and it's re later referred to as the deep things of Satan. Earlier in our, in our study, one of our churches was said to be dealing with the synagogue of Satan. That's because the Jewish uh, people were putting a lot of pressure on them. In another, in another, we were said that there was the throne of Satan, and that was sort of the political push upon the church. Both of those were external places that Satan was pressing down upon this church. In Thyatira, it was within the church. And it wasn't just that it was, it was thought about, it was actively encouraged and accepted by the church. A lot of them had no problem with this Jezebel teaching. It's okay to worship these other idols as long as you believe in Jesus Christ. It's okay to do these things because, hey, you got to put food on the table. Or, hey, it's okay to enjoy it. You're saved. Do whatever you want. Jesus is going to forgive you. Honestly, brothers and sisters, this is a lot of what our culture exists in today. We are a church, we are, excuse me, we are a society saturated with permissiveness, with sensuality. Turn on the television, you'll see it. Even in our commercials, you'll see it. We are saturated with this, also this concept that you can do evil, deplorable, despicable things and you can be engaged in all kinds of unrighteousness, but it's okay because you're forgiven. We call it cheap grace, is how we kind of describe it. It was dealt with in other times in the, in the, in the Bible. Paul, called, Paul said, so you want to sin so that you'll be more forgiven? May it not be. May it never be. That is an abuse of grace. And so many times we think that it's okay for us to do whatever we want to do. But hey, God forgives. God does forgive. But that's not license. That's not permission. That's not God looking down at us and saying, okay, it's okay now. Just go be crazy. And sacrifice to idols. And indulge in things that are contrary to God's word. But in the church in Thyatira, they had someone actively proclaiming it, and the church seemed to be doing nothing about it. So Christ says, I'll do something about it. Verse 21. I gave her time to repent, but she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. That's even a, a something to ponder there, isn't it? Christ says, I gave her time to repent. I gave her opportunity. I gave her chance. I gave her ability. I gave her the time to repent, but she did not not want to repent. She refuses to repent. Brothers and sisters, if that's where you are, you need to seriously think about that state where Christ has, has in, your, in your own heart or in your reading of God's word or just in your soul as the Holy Spirit has tried to get your attention. You know, you know you're engaged and actively, habitually engaging in an activity or a thought life or a, or a pattern of behavior or language or something that you know, you know is wrong. But you say, I refuse to repent. I like this. I like this sin. I'm going to hang on to it. It's not that bad. It's what I like. It brings me pleasure. It meets my needs. I'm going to stick with this. It's who I am, and I don't care if God himself tells me to stop. I'm not going to do it. That's the state that Jezebel was in. J. 
Jesus says in verse 22, Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches heart and mind, and that I will give to each of you as your works deserve. Jezebel likes a bed, <laughs> I'll throw into a sick bed. A sick bed where I will anyone who lies with her will be met, met with tribulation and hardship unless they repent. It is a word that is repeated to these churches. Brothers and sisters, hear it repeated here again. It's time to lay it down. It's time to give it up. It's time to stop it. It's time to seek forgiveness for it. It's time to move on in the Lord. And whatever that it is for you, it is time. It might be some sexual thing going on in your life. It might be something totally on the other end of the spectrum of sin. But it is time. Christ is patient. Christ is long-suffering. Christ is merciful. And Christ is holy. And Christ desires a pure bridegroom. And Christ finds sin abhorrent. And we who are his children should find it abhorrent also. Don't coddle sin. Don't baby sin. Don't play with it. Don't try to tame it. Don't try to keep it in the back closet. Get rid of it. Get it out of your house. Get it out of your life. The God who is a, a refining fire, the God who has burnished bronze feet, cries out to this woman, repent. She won't. Those who are suffering because of their continued impurity with her are suffering. He cries out, repent. Will they hear? Will we? Verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not, who, excuse me, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay hold on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken into pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I don't know of many guilds today. I don't know of many associations. I don't know of many jobs that require you to practice sensuality or to offer up idols to other deities. I, I can't think of one. Um, maybe the Screen Actors Guild Award in Hollywood. I don't know, just from what I've seen. I don't know. So it's not a pressure of your occupation. That which holds us, that which holds sin in our lives, is more personal than practical. You may have a career that asks you to do unsavory things. I think Christ will come to you and say, stand strong. Reject those things. We don't live in this duality, as some like to describe it, where I, my spirit, is holy, and it doesn't matter what my body does or what my, my mouth says. Some believers want to say that, that my Christian life is separate from my other life, and I can be a good believer, and I can do these terrible things. And we live in a world that honestly tries to champion that. I'm going to pull out an old reference, and I may have used it before. 
Um, any Pirates of the Caribbean fans? The movie's not the ride. Okay, the ride's fine too. Y'all just don't want to. Okay, is this too old? I mean, but no, y'all know. Y'all just seen didn't like it. There's a scene in the movie, in the first movie, where there's a pirate named Captain Jack Sparrow, and he is talking to uh, uh, I don't know what you can call him. We'll just call him a friend of his, the son of another pirate named Bootstrap Bill. His name is Will Turner, and he says to Will, you need to be able to accept the fact that your father was both a pirate and a good man. And, and that is a notion that is being brought up a lot. You can do terrible, horrible, despicable things and still be a good person. But we live in a culture that has begun to separate our actions and our behaviors and our lifestyles from who we are. Our spirituality is not something that we can break out of our life and say, this is who I am as a person, and this is who I am as a believer. They're the same. The words you use, the thoughts you entertain, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you engage with your coworkers, the way you treat your family, it's all a part of who you are as a believer. And for these Christians in Thyatira who had got so led astray, brainwashed by this, this self-proclaimed prophetess, they had said to themselves, it's okay, I can live one way and I can, and I can believe a different way. And it seemed like a lot of the church in that city was okay with that way of thinking. We can't promote that. We can't entertain that. We can't abide that. We've got to encourage people spiritually as well as the way they live their lives. And to the rest of the people, he said, I don't hold anything against you. If we just took out that chunk about this woman Jezebel and her followers, what we would read was, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. Hold close to these things. What do we need to do in our own lives? What is it we need to rip out of our lives through the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? What is it that needs to be removed from our soul so that we can hear those words? What is it in our churches that needs to say we're not going to tolerate that because we want to be a holy, acceptable bride to Jesus Christ? What is it we need to encourage one another towards? And then how do we just keep encouraging each other to endure? Christ didn't lay more upon this church. He simply said maintain these things. Maintain the faith. Maintain that increased works of righteousness. Maintain the service. Keep strong in patient endurance and he who maintains he who works and conquers and who keeps my works until the end to him I will give authority over the nations just as he himself received authority from his father if, 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 if sensuality and sexuality and, and lewdness and you're not having some great sin dragging you down in your life you need to find joy and comfort in that thing and you need to maintain that and live that and celebrate that. And you need to share that with others. And you need to encourage them to do that as well. But if it's not you, and there's something in your life, what's it going to take? Is it going to take tribulation? Is it going to take God showing up in your life and raking you across the coals to try to bring you about to a restoration? I'm not saying He will, but we see Him declaring it here to one of the seven churches. And I think that's just a... It's the point of ultimate correction, I guess. It's the rock bottom. 
It's that place that you can get in your life where there's nowhere else to turn. And maybe that's what it's going to take for some. But you don't have to live that long. You don't have to. Whatever that sin is that you're hanging on to, whatever that habit is, whatever that, that the attraction is that brings you to that point, realize the lie that it is telling you. Realize that it is lying and deceiving you and taking you farther and farther away from God. You don't get to hang on to it and be a strong believer. You can't serve two masters. A house divided will not stand. It is lying to you just as this Jezebel was lying to those early Christians. It's time to let it go. Maybe you need some time here at the front where, where we on this table every quarter remember the ultimate laying down of life, the sacrifice of Jesus' cross to pay for those sins. Maybe it's that sin that you need to come and lay down right down front here just this morning. You can do it standing where you are, but sometimes there's a, there's a, a special or significant impression left by laying it down at the foot of the table or what some call the altar and saying, I lay this down. Christ, forgive me. And never pick it up again. For some of you, this is the day to begin that relationship. This is the day to say, I know my life is marked with sin. I know my life is marked by things that are ungodly, that don't agree with what God's Word says, that even don't hold up to my own standards of morality. I'm ready to lay those down, accept Christ as my Savior, and seek that forgiveness, and live for Him, and grow in faith, and grow in my relationship with Him, and serve Him as I can. It's time to lay down sin, and put your faith in Jesus Christ. I'll be standing down here, right down front. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that decision to give your life over to Him. Maybe you're looking for a church home where you can be a part of something, where you can know that God is, is going to use you and your talents and your abilities to do something wonderful. I think He's doing that here at Oakdale. Maybe today is the day to join this church and say, I want to be with these people who show love and support and who are going to declare God to this world. Make the decision today. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Do it today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would guide us. Heavenly Father, be with us. Strengthen us. For those individuals who you are calling to repent, Heavenly Father, call to them. Shout over the sound of the sin that has bound them. Shake loose the chains of sin that tie them. Brother and sister, be willing now. Repentance. It's time. Don't wait. Don't wait for the tribulation. Don't wait for the heartache. Don't wait for the turmoil to set in. Be free from it now. Through Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray.